<laughs> yeah, well, so since you mentioned about pizza, I have to give our little sponsor. Our sponsor tonight is the Center for Supply Chain Management. They're upstairs on the second floor. We have a student actually from Center for Supply Chain Management. And then uh, Jim Saad runs the project management program. I believe we have a student in here in the student phase. The, uh, today's speaker, Debbie Krasik, runs her own sales consulting business. Uh, she has over 20 years of proven sales experience. Her book over here, the sales, uh, it's called The uh, Field Guide to Sales, is available after the show. Please welcome Debbie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you it's so great to be with you. Um, okay, who are the Mavs fans in the room? Thank you. Duly noted, I was at the Lakers game Sunday, Mother's Day. How many of you gentlemen are married? Yes, my children are no longer in the home, and so I get this on Saturday. Did you have anything special in mind for Mother's Day since the kids aren't here? Um, I said, no, I thought we'd go to, to lunch or something. He said, well, you know, I, I do have tickets for the Mavs game tomorrow. I went, are you kidding me? He said no, and I never go because I think it's such a waste of money on me because I don't understand the game like I'm sure many of you do. Let me assure you, I had a great time. If ever there was a game to go to, that was it. And everybody had always talked about, he has great seats. Who knew? He had great seats. You know, at the half, you know, this lady's coming up and it's like, well, my golly, that looks like Hillary Swank. And it was. She is a lot lovelier in person, and she's very tiny compared to how big she looks on the big screen. So we will have you out of here and on your way on time tonight so you can at least hear it in the car on the way. <laughs> well, I really am delighted to be here. I was sharing with Renee, and I'm going to date myself. My career started at Texas Instruments in Lubbock, Texas. I was going to Texas Tech University, and uh, we got transferred, my husband got transferred to Dallas, so I came to UTD, imagine this, in 1979. Yeah. You were four. I was four. And those two buildings over there, and what I was telling him is that I worked for Texas Instruments, and back at that time, UTD was known as TI University. And so I worked all day with these people, but at night they were our professors. You know, so that was just really a hoot. So it's wonderful to be here. And it's like so far how you've come because I was having to sit with the dean of the business school when I arrived to explain how serious I was about being a student after he saw my GPA from Texas Tech after being there a few years and having a very good time. So this set me on the straight and narrow. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight. So what I want to start with, each of you thinking about your own business and where you are, if it were a reality show, what reality show would your business, your job, your position be? The Amazing Race, X Factor, The Osbournes, I love that. The Office, I love it. Survivor, anybody? Yeah, I even saw this one. It was uh, um, uh, from Canada, actually, Renee. It was called Total Drama Island. Huh. Yeah. Who works there? <laughs> yes. Who has worked there? We're not working there anymore. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, I want you to think about you know, what your day-to-day -day life is and what you do. When Renee asked me to be with you tonight, I, I'm so delighted so many of you came that, you know, have something to do with sales or have done it in the past and love it. You are my people. We love you. Uh, but the truth is, you know, everybody does sales. Everybody does. How many of you all ever got a parent to let you do something they had already said, absolutely no way, you can't do? I love her. Of course, we all did. You have been in sales since birth. Yes, so get over it. You know, there's such a um, stereotype with it that people are like, I am not a salesperson. I am not a salesperson. Well, let me ask you something. How did you get the job you have today? How did you get that salary you have today? How did you get that budget approved? How did you get that idea accepted? If you think that's anything other than sales, hello, I'm here to tell you that is sales. Sales is sales is sales. But, you know, the deal with sales, I have a program called I Hate Sales and So Should You. And, you know, have you ever spoken in front of the audience and somebody, their mouth works quicker than their brain? You know, I've got all these people and I say, I have this program called I Hate Sales and So Should You. And this guy went, do you know what the name of your company is? 
I said, yes, it's a sales company. He said, shouldn't you love sales? I said, well, I love good sales, but I hate that same kind of sales you do. We all hate to be sold. We love to buy. We love it when people share their ideas with us. I even tell people, you know, I have a great car salesperson, you know, if you can imagine. You know, he, uh, it's like we buy cars and two or three phone calls and he delivers them to the door and picks up the old one. You know, I think he, you know, he's with Sewell Cadillac and he is uh, just a godsend. But at the end of the day, he's a salesperson. I think he's brilliant. How many people love your car salesperson? Yes, you can love your car salesperson. So my question for each of you today is what do you sell? Anybody? Ideas? Your management, yes? Change. Change. I love it. Who else? Ideas. Ideas? Solutions. Solutions. Problems. Solutions to problems, yes. Anybody else? Project cool. Management. Pardon? Project management. Project management, exactly. So, you know, everybody does it. So just kind of have that thought in your mind. What are you selling? Just think about what you're doing this week. What are you trying to accomplish this week? Who are you talking to this week? Who do you have to convey something to that maybe they're not in agreement with you? You know, so you're just, you know, it's an idea. It's a concept or something at all. So what do you sell? Ideas, budgets, um, yourself, you know? I mean, how many of y'all are the leader on your team? You know, we've all had tough times the last couple of years, but you're the one. You've got to show up. You've got to convince them. It's good that they all came to work today. They're ready. We were talking about, um, tell me your name again. Mary, Mary works out of her home, you know, but her program, her people are everywhere. And I was sharing with her, my sister works for Northrop Grumman. And so her projects are spread out in people, but she's responsible for those people, you know, and motivating them and leading them. And how do you do that when you're on the phone or Skype or, you know, you're just emailing them? So what is it you need to be doing this week and how are you going to get it done as it has to do with sales? So first of all, do you have a goal? You know, I talk about in sales, you know, having a forecast, you know, having a process. But in any of these things, when you're trying to, you know, help other people understand what it is you want them to do, you want them to buy your product, buy your idea, what is your plan for that? You know, salespeople who are just starting think, you know, they just walk in and it's like, okay, I've got this. Do you want it? And you go, no. And they go, oh, this is really hard. One of the things, if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, take this away in sales. One of the cardinal things is do not ask yes, no questions. When you ask yes, no questions, the conversation's over quick when you say, do you want this? And they go, no. It is also very uncomfortable. You know, when they have surveyed uh, successful salespeople, you know, you, they, it might be that you think there's something like wazoo that they do. It's not. It's about this. It's about having a goal. It's about having a plan. It's about having a process and knowing what you're going to do. And as it has to do with questions, salespeople, great salespeople know that it's a process. So what do I want to accomplish in the first phone call? What do I want to accomplish in the first email or the first visit? You know, how many things have to happen? How many meetings do we have to have before the sale or the event happens? So if it takes seven times, then what has to happen for the first one? And what are the questions there? The questions you need to be asking are the open-ended questions. Who, what? Where, why, how, when. If you make it more about them from the beginning, asking those questions for every step of the way in your process, you will be a lot more effective. And at the end of the process, you will probably have the order. And even more important than that, you'll have the relationship that goes on for maybe the next project or the next order or those kind of things. And great salespeople Great salespeople are the ones. I'm not talking about the guy that calls you at dinner and interrupts your dinner going, you know, do you want this? I'm not talking about that kind of script. But great salespeople write out in advance what are the questions they want to ask. How many of you are old enough to remember Johnny Carson? 
Okay? Johnny Carson had this routine with Carnac, you know? You know what the answer is you want. You want them to say, yes, we will buy that. Yes, we will do what you suggest. Yes, we love your idea. You know that. So what is the question that you need to ask to elicit information that can get you to that yes? Okay? This is not for the faint of heart. That's hard work. And so when you start writing down what those questions are, and I say to people, and I offer this to each and every one of you, you have my information on there. You know, if you would like to send me your questions that you're trying to work with to get something to happen uh, in your project or your business, and I'll, I'd be delighted to take a look at them. I can't tell you, though, how many people send me the questions, and I look through them, and three out of ten of them will still be yes, no questions. They really have to be who, what, where, when, why, and how. They have to elicit information. So think about what do you need to accomplish on the first visit, on the second visit, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. And also, each time you do this, the better you get at it, you fine tune your process and you go, you know what? I can do that first visit, if you will, in five questions. If I can just get the answers to these five questions, we can move to B. And in the second part of the process, man, if I can figure out these three things, then I can move to the third. Well, guess what? If you figure this out and you can move from the beginning to the end in less time, how much money is it worth to you in the less time? I sold semiconductors, printed circuit boards, contract manufacturing. You know, those things take time. They have to be designed in. You know, they have to be approved by engineering departments, and you've got to deal with purchasing departments. And if the sale is big enough, then you have to deal with management and finance departments, which is fun when you get the commission check. But in the process, it's always, you know, a little hairy. So if I learned how to be better at this, so instead of things taking six months or nine months, they take three months, how much more can I sell? I was very lucky to work with someone who taught me this early. The book is actually dedicated to a man called Terry the Tank Pritchett. The Tank is relevant here. He looked like a tank coming through. But I thought he was a monster when I worked for him. No joke. Came out of both of us, came out of Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments was big on process, process, and process. Everybody was an engineer. You had to have sales just because. You know, the company couldn't work just on engineers. But Terry was really one of those about, you know, asking the questions, getting it done, and you had to have a forecast. You had to have it. You had to have a plan. What are you going to do here? What are you going to do there? Well, why? And how come? Man, I would get up every day. I am type A, firstborn child. I have no problem getting out of bed, raring to go in the morning, and this man would call every day. In all my wisdom at 27... I quit. I write the, uh, the dedication in the book. At 50, of course, I realize he was a genius. And I have, of course, been uh, doing consulting and coaching for 17 years now. And that's what I teach, is everything I learned from him. So if you can figure out your process, your forecast, your plan, figure out how to shorten the time frame, you will make more money. And here's the other kicker. Not only can you figure out how to do more sales more quickly, you will make more money generally because all those questions and the planning and the preparing you did, you did such a much better job than your competition. You know more so you can sell whatever you have for more. So you are more profitable. And then not only are you more profitable per transaction, you also then have developed the relationship. Hopefully you cared when you asked those questions and were going through that process. And they want to do business with you again and again and again. And imagine if you do such a great job the first time and you establish that relationship that when it comes in for the second opportunity, the second project you're going to do, and you can skip through the first three parts because you kind of already know each other and I know you like to have it done this way and I know you really work this way. I know your team prefers it like this and we can get to here. They will want to work with you again and again. Today I am working with people that I knew 30 years ago. 30 years ago. 
I have a friend who was with Dresser Industries in Houston, Texas. If you can imagine me working in the seismic industry in Houston, Texas, <clears throat> 20 plus years ago, there weren't a lot of girls. Yeah, it was fun. But there was a young man working as an engineer, and we were about the same age, and everybody else was old as far as we thought. And um, he engineered, I did sales, and, all, and he used to say, you're having so much more fun than I am over here. And it was like, well, come do sales. And he's like, ooh, it's like the dark side. No. But anyway, fast forward over the years, he evolved in sales. And one day I get a call from him, and he's like, girl, you need to come talk to me. I'm like, well, where are you? He was in charge of a global sales operation. I said, well, that's fun. Who do we need to talk to? He said, no problem. He said, I presented you to, are you ready? Global operation, big time, big bucks. I presented you to the board of directors yesterday. I'm like, what in the world did you present? Well, I just told them everything for the last 30 years and everything, and they said, if I like you and think you're that great, you should just come. Sold. 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 30 years. It wasn't like I didn't keep up with him in between, you know, and that's the other thing. So how bad do you want it? What do you want to do? Do you want to have to sell every idea every time? Do you want to have to convince people every time? Or do you want to invest and do what it takes to figure out how to do it the first time so you can make it work for you again and again and again? If anybody had told me all those years ago that all that that I was doing, running and working so hard would be the kind of investment that years later somebody would pick up the phone and say, we want you. Come now. We haven't even talked about the price. We haven't talked about what you want to have done. We want you. Is that what you want? Would it make your life easier? Sales. Sales, sales, sales. So have a plan. Have a goal. And you know the old deal about, uh, what is it, if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I don't know whoever said that, but you know, I think there's a whole lot of truth in it no matter what you're doing. Um, and today, okay, first of all, Renee, thank you very much for making them all introduce yourself. But what I want you all to do tonight when you go home, shut the door so your spouse, your girlfriend, whatever doesn't hear you, but I want you all to practice in the mirror introducing yourself in a more loud manner. Some of you are very quiet. It is very hard to hear you. Okay? They want to hear you. You ought to be able to say your name in a way that says you're here, not what people, whoops, now maybe I'll whop you over the head. <laughs> Not whop you over the head, but you know that they know you're here and what you want. A lot of it is, you know, did your mother ever tell you about that first impression? You know, what's the first impression? Well, you know, in sales, what you always want to do, you want to have good posture, you know, feet firmly planted. You want to have a handshake, a firm handshake, but gentlemen, don't break the lady's hand, you know, kind of deal. I've even had ladies that you know, overcompensated, you know, really tough. But you want to do eye contact, but not staring. You know, it's one of the greatest things about a, a business card. If you have a business card and you're a little uncomfortable meeting people, you know, when you're, say, you're extending your hand and, hello, I'm Debbie Morizek, and you are? Bob. Bob, so nice to meet you. And in our culture, how we extend a business card, well, if you have a card, and you're talking to him and asking him what he does, you know, you have a pen with you, and you can look down, and you can take notes on the back of the card. You know, believe it or not, you all don't experience me tonight as an introvert, I know that, but always being raised, I was raised in a family where children were seen and not heard. We got over it after we went to college. But it is that, you know, most people don't like to be stared at, you know. And most people aren't truly, really comfortable with strangers. And so, you know, if you can be confident in the way that you say your name, in your posture, in your handshake, in things that you don't say, I'm confident, but they say everything about you. So each of you work on how you introduce yourself and what you say. And then when you're talking about your 30-second introduction, for mine oftentimes what I say, you know, you're at a luncheon, you know, there's like 10 people at a table, and my question usually is, my company is the sales company, but I say, are you the best seller in your business? And generally most people will chuckle a little bit and go, 
Uh, it's like, come on, would you win the Academy Award in your business at the end of the year for the great sales that you do? No, or maybe yes. And if it's yes, I still would love to know you. But if it's no, that's what we do is we help people become best sellers. So what's your 30 second introduction? How do you engage people? How do they know who you are, a little bit about you, a little about your persona so that they want to talk to you more? Okay, and you need to be who you are. I talk about starting in the seismic industry. I used to wear a navy suit, dark stockings, dark shoes, a little bow tie, a white shirt, and you know, I didn't really laugh. You know, I didn't talk so much. I just came in and talked semiconductors. You know, but that wasn't really who I am. You know, I am a person that, you know, I would love to know about you and your family and what do you do when you're not working so hard? You know, and what's this project really about? And when I started being more who I was versus who I thought I should be, because I needed to be like somebody that was very successful that I admired is what I thought. And when I realized I didn't need to be like him, I needed to be me, not only did business get to be a whole lot more fun, it was also a lot more successful. So whether you are shy or you are extroverted, it does not matter which you are. You don't need to be anything else. Be who you are, but let them know who you are and be confident about what you do and what you want to have happen. So let them know. So how many of y'all, the way that you are doing sales, you're doing your project management today, it's really working for you? Like you are off the charts successful, you know it all, and you know you just came tonight to support Renee in this great project, I mean this great program. Well, the truth is, what is it Dr. Phil says? So how's that working for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, um, I don't know about many of you, but the other night when you know, we found out about Bin Laden, I actually immediately went to tears. On 9-11, after that happened, within one week, I lost 85% of my business. Now, I think I'm pretty good, but I am not good enough to replace 85% of my business quickly. And the deal was nobody knew what was happening in the world. Nobody knew. So people said, Deb, I don't know what to do. I mean, we're going to let you go, you know, because I'm consulting most of the time. I'm really sorry. You know, we don't want to, but we don't know what we're going to do. You know, and it was like, oh, my gosh. Well, you know, from that day to this, my business has been very different than the first seven years. And so looking at, you know, I'm still selling the same thing, but how I sell is different. I got better about relationships and I had relationships that I didn't really realize that I had you know I had people that would help me and do that you know and all and I learned it was okay you know I, I felt like a failure I felt like a failure that it was my fault that 85 percent of that business went away you know and I had somebody older and wiser come to me and said sweetheart there is no way in the world that you could plan that in this lifetime nobody can so too bad it happened. You got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and let's see who do we know that might need something, just a little something. So it won't be a big project, but it'll be a little project. And you know what? We had to look at doing it differently. You know, so when Dr. Phil says, how's that working for you? Well, how I used to do it didn't really work for me anymore. And so fast forward, here we are, you know, 10 years later, and it's working pretty good. And have we had changes, you know, in the last 10 years? I also had one of those life hiccups. I had cancer, but y'all are stuck with me the next 50 years. We survived. No, <laughs> it's all good. And, uh, but it was a hiccup for a year, you know, and all. And it's just like, but you just have to adjust the sales. And the deal is you keep on. So the way you've been selling, the way you've been conveying ideas, the way you've been doing things, maybe they work, but maybe the truth is they haven't been working so good for some time and you haven't really acknowledged it. So maybe just step back. Maybe you have a trusted advisor or a mentor or somebody on your team you can brainstorm well with and just have that conversation about, you know, I'm not sure this is working the same. How do we used to sell this? How did we used to get these things done? What could we do differently? change you know 
How can we change? The one thing in our society today, change is no, letter, no longer a bad word. You know, we always change. We just didn't acknowledge it. Now we know it happens, you know, every day, in every way, in all kinds of things. So what is it that maybe you need to be looking at, how you're selling, how you're conveying ideas to change that? Um, and then great ways to increase sales. So I talked a little bit about customer retention. If you could get people to buy from you again and again and again, that's the greatest thing. That's one of the things I loved about selling products. You know, like you designed in a great semiconductor or printed circuit board, and they, you know, you wanted them to sell a lot so you could keep selling a lot yourself, you know, versus having to redesign every quarter, which wasn't fun sometimes. But how can you retain your customers? Well, there's all kinds of ways to retain customers because, you know, they don't all, like in my case, you know, where they bought commodities. Now we sell consulting. So somebody might come to you and they need to help with a project this year, but they may not need you for two years. Well, the way you retain customers for two years, 30 years, whatever it is, is by keeping in touch. And we are so lucky today with all the technology that we have in the world that we can still keep in touch with people, whether it's email, whether we have a newsletter, uh, even the, uh, and let me tell you, in today's world, we're finding, you know, it's kind of like the, maybe it's vintage, the U.S. Post Office. But we're finding a resurgence in sales of people going back to the old-fashioned post office and mailing something and writing your name on it. And guess what? People don't get a lot of mail anymore that's hand addressed and they're opening it. You know, even if it's a business something, they're opening it. So how do you retain customers today? How do you keep up with them? Uh, how do you let them know that you're thinking of them? Uh, just like you're at a great event tonight, you talked about bringing somebody. You know, you bring them to professional events for you that don't have anything to do with sales. It's just something you thought maybe they would be interested in. You included them tonight. My new friend here tonight came from an introduction of another colleague of mine who was hoping to be here tonight. And so, you know, you invite them. You share you have a shared experience doing something different than what you might normally be doing at the office or in your regular sales process. So what are ways that you can retain them? Because what you're really interested in, what it, this is what great salespeople want. What is the lifetime value of a client? You know, how many of y'all have been in that experience, especially my salespeople in here, where somebody came in and they took the deal? And it was dirt cheap. You know there was no money in it. It was a horrible deal, and they took it, and it's off the table. Well, the truth is there are people that are very short-sighted that way, and they do that. But if you're interested in the lifetime value of the client, and somebody comes to you and says, well, we have a great deal, and this is it, and this is the price, and you simply need to say, that is so wonderful for you, but that is not a good piece of business for us. We wish you well with that. If anything changes, anything comes up differently, we would be delighted to try to serve you again. And you step away. You do not, when I am talking about sales tonight, I am not talking about unprofitable sales. I'm not talking about bad sales. I'm talking about the kind of sales that when you walk away from the table, they're dancing and so are you. That's great sales. But that kind of sale where maybe you, learn, you lose the first battle, maybe you even lose the second battle. But you come back, you win the third, the fourth, the fifth, and you're still talking about it years from now. One of my most successful, how many of y'all know Alcatel here in town? Used to be DSC. I started with them, not started with them, excuse me, I was selling to them when they were in Richardson. But I was only selling semiconductors then, and then I moved into the printed circuit board world. Well, in the DFW area at that time, the largest consumers of printed circuit boards were DSC, and do you remember Tandy over in Fort Worth, and Texas Instruments. Those were the three biggest. I live at Coit and Legacy, so I had to go by Coit and Plano Parkway, you know, every evening. So I decided to pick DSC was going to be my big printed circuit board uh, customer. Unfortunately, I had not been in there selling printed circuit boards and the people that I had had been there for years and doing a stellar job. But every evening on my way home, because I was doing outside sales, I was out and about every day, every evening, and you can call Sue Ashmore, she'll tell you, for three years, I stopped at DSC 
and sat in their lobby and made my calls at the end of the day in their lobby. And I had visited, I'd introduced myself to people, I'd said what I wanted and what I did and offer there, and I was just there. People thought I worked there, you know, after that amount of time. But one evening, and I tell this story on him, Curtis Wade, in case any of you all know him, he just, bam, hits the door, coming off the manufacturing floor, and he went, I knew you would be here. You have been talking about, you could do these things and all. Well, guess what? We just shut down the East coast. Now can you imagine shutting down all the phones on the east coast? You would be a little panicked too. He's like, what can you do? Well the truth was my printed circuit board company that I sold boards for was in Santa Clara, California. But in all my, I stood very tall and said I will have them here for breakfast in the morning and we will fix it. And he was just like, whatever, you know, I'm going to die tonight anyway is really what I think he was thinking. And sure enough, I, I'm just like, and thank you, sir. We appreciate the opportunity. Goodbye. And I ran out of the car. I'm on the phone with the guys in Santa Clara going, guys, today is the day. You know, you all have to come tonight, the red eye. I don't care what the plane tickets cost. And God knows you know how much those plane tickets cost. I need your suits. I need your ties. I need clean. You can polish each other's shoes. I need you here. In the morning, 7.30 the next morning, they were lined up like soldiers in the DSC lobby. And you could see they had these big windows to the parking lot. And you could see Curtis get out of the car and he opened that door. And I won't even tell you what he really said. But are you kidding me? I said, you shut down the East Coast. You said you needed my team. Here they are. We did $20 million that year. $20 million in printed circuit boards can make a car payment or two for me. Was it worth three years of stopping every night? And I mean, like I said, I'd call them people, tell people what I did. How bad do you want it? The question in sales always is, how many times do I have to call on them? I already told them six times what I do. How many times do I have to go there? My answer, you can catch me in the dead of night, sound asleep, and I'll tell you, how bad do you want it? There were only three companies in Dallas, Texas that were doing more than $10 million a year. I wanted it. And I got it. And not only did I get it that year, and the next year, and the next year, and here we are years later, and I don't sell printed circuit boards anymore, but we do other things, and we still do it. So what is it worth to you, and how do you do customer retention? How bad do you want it? Prospecting. So who needs new business? Who needs new ideas? Where do you get it from? You know, we, we're all bright people. We have lots in our head. You know, boy, I wish they'd come up with a Rolodex, you know, for our brains. You know, what was I doing on, you know, have you heard those stories on TV about some people can remember every day of their life? I'm not sure I want to do that, but there are certain things in there. I wish I knew how to access them. But the deal with prospecting is you don't have to do this by yourself whether it's a new idea or a new customer. How many of y'all know the rule of 250? Oh boy. Renee, I'm so glad you came again tonight. <laughs> the rule of 250 is each and every one of us know at least 250 people. You do. You do, exactly. And the exercise behind this, if you don't believe me, is you know, sit down, start with your family, you know, write down your family's names, then who are your friends, who are your neighbors, who are your colleagues, who have you worked with before. Uh, guys, you always great at this. You can remember everybody on the starting lineup of your Little League baseball team. You know, name them. You know, write it all down. The joy about those 250 is each of them know 250. Between you and 250 people you know, you can probably figure out a new idea a new opportunity, somebody that works at that company. The story I always like to tell is I had a young lady that was raised in my church and she went away to college in Stanford and Chelsea Clinton ended up being her roommate. And so when Christmas time rolled around, you know, she was so excited she got invited to the White House and she said, Mrs. M. I get to go to the White House, then President and Mrs. Clinton, you know, and Chelsea, and this is so great. Is there anything you'd like me to tell him? And I'm like, no, nothing 18-year-olds should be repeating. <laughs> but the truth is, 
Now I'm one person from me, and I'm, this is not a political conversation, so asterisk there. Sorry, I forgot to say that up front. Uh, but one of the most powerful people on the face of the globe in the free world. I'm one person from them. If I can be one person from that person, who am I trying to sell this week? Where am I trying to get in? What am I trying to do? Fast forward to the next administration. For those of you who don't know, President George W. Bush and Laura Bush, their church is Highland Park United Methodist here in Dallas, and Reverend Mark Craig was their minister. He was our minister for a while. Mark prayed with them every week while he was there. Some weeks we'd call Mark and say, Mark, we have a couple of things we'd like you to add to the list for George this week. But the truth is, we're one person from this other person that's one of the most powerful people on the face of the globe. And then fast forward to our current administration. I always tell this story. My husband has a business, and once a year we do a Christmas party for all the employees and the suppliers and everything. So I get to go and be the boss's wife, which means I have to be well-behaved and good and nice to everybody. And so it had been the election year. It had been really crazy, and these people are pretty outspoken and bold, you know, and so I was saying to him as we were going to the dinner, gosh, I hope everybody behaves tonight and nobody's talking about politics, just let it go, it's Christmas, you know, just celebrate, you know, enjoy and all. We get there, we make it through cocktails, we make it through hors d'oeuvres, and then it's like, any of you seen that E.F. Hutton commercial? One gentleman says, hey, does anybody need to know of Mr. O <laughs> yeah, at that time, so Mr. Obama? And it was like that moment, and I'm thinking, the whole room, there were like 80 people seated for dinner, and he just kind of looked around, and he's like, well, he's my friend, and we play basketball, so if anybody wants to know him or talk to him, he said, I'd just be glad to introduce you. And I'm going, who would believe that now we are one person from yet another of the most... So if we can be one person from three people who are the most powerful people on the face of the globe in the free world, guess what that makes all of you all tonight? You are good. Who do we need to call it Accenture and write to them? <laughs> yeah, you're two people. So if you are two people from three of the most powerful people on the face of the globe in the free world, who do you want to do business with? What project do you want to get approved? What idea do you want to convey to somebody? What do you want to get done? Prospecting. Who is in your 250? Write it down. You know, I talked about the great salespeople write down their questions and things and all. The great salespeople also know who's in their Rolodex. And they know who's in their Rolodex's Rolodex. Who do you want to know? Who do you want to know? Okay? the more specific you can be. And for the last 10 years, I've actually been in our community here working with various career outreach programs at churches because sales is what I do and people lose their jobs so they have to be able to sell themselves. And so what I tell them is, all, you know, we have many great technical people that have all kinds of degrees and alphabets after their name that none of us really know what all of it is. And so I say, just tell us three company names that you would like to go to work for and tell everybody you know. Do you know anybody at ABC, XYZ, and IZF? And it's amazing who knows people there that they can help you with. So the more specific, the more work you do up front, the more planning you do, the more research you do, the more others are going to be able to help you. Your prospecting will be off the chart. You will kill the competition. And we'll talk about them in a minute. And networking, how many of y'all hate networking? You're Pinocchios. I know there's somebody in here. Oh, one. Oh, there she is. You were not a Pinocchio. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, the thing about networking is people have been subjected to what I consider, you know, it's like bad sales. You know, when I say I hate sales, I could easily say I hate networking. You know, you've been there where people just kind of, you know, they throw business cards at you and, you know, we do this. And what are they? they don't ask about you. They don't care about you. They don't say, what do you do? The key to networking, to really making it work, is always remember to give first. Give first. Give first. Give the other person the opportunity to introduce themselves first. Maybe it's their first time here tonight. They're a little uncomfortable. They don't know anybody here. Give first. Give them the opportunity. 
Give first. Ask them the question specifically about what they do. How can I help you? What would make it a great week for you this week? Who do I know that might be able to help you with what you're trying to accomplish? And when you are genuine about giving, even though that person in front of you is a perfect stranger, they connect with you. It is how humans work. Networking does not have to be like a four-letter word, but there are plenty of people that make it seem worse than a four-letter word. Don't you be one of them. So the key to networking is to give first. But if, in fact, you get in that situation where you are doing that and the other person doesn't have enough grace to turn around and ask you, and what do you do and how might I help you, then this is where, you know, I was saying practice in the mirror tonight about how you introduce yourself. It may be a little awkward at first, but what you can do, you don't even have to touch the person, but just kind of, you know, like reach to them. And let me share with you what I'm looking for this week. I would love to meet Renee. I see that he's here today and somebody, I saw you sp speaking with him earlier. Might you introduce me to him? Yes. People want to help you do whatever you want to do, but most often times they don't know what you need. So the sooner you feel comfortable about asking, about being specific, they can help you. When we were talking about earlier, um, orchestra technology has very specific things that they do, and they know who they want to be their clients and all. And so I was saying to them, you need to ask everybody you know. Who knows somebody at ABC, XYZ? People want to help you get in. It isn't necessarily the person that's going to give him the contract, but somebody internal to the company that he's wanting to do that then takes him and introduces him to the person who would write the contract is a powerful introduction. And the deal about networking is if you're doing it all the time, you know, you don't need something all the time. But then when you do, I know for me, when I send out, you know, like a quick, um, you know, like a note or an email saying, hey, guys, I'm working on this deal. Does anybody know this? People are delighted to respond. You know, if you're the one that's always helping, they're delighted to always be helping you. But be specific in what you want. And then follow up. <sighs> Salespeople, salespeople. One of the things that salespeople are the worst at is following up. You know, they do all this work, they go out, they get the opportunity, and then they don't follow up. Or they follow up late. Or they don't follow up thoroughly. You know, if you have gotten the opportunity, if you have gotten what you said that you want, you must follow up. If you've networked, if you've prospected with somebody, the first thing you need to do is call them and say thank you. Even if the deal doesn't work out for you, you need to say thank you because that's an opportunity, even if it didn't work out, for the person who introduced you to be better next time about introducing you to the right person so you can help them. But following up, following up in a timely basis, even if you can't do anything for them, follow up and say, we thank you so much for the opportunity, but we can't do it this time. Or if you initially committed to a certain time and you realize when you get back with your team you can't make that, call today and say, we know you wanted that on Thursday and we wanted to do that for you, but it's going to take till Monday. Would that be okay? Most often times people will say yes. But where they get irritated is that you don't follow up and say it's going to take till Monday. So they wait for you Thursday. They wait for you Friday. And then by the time you call on Monday, you can have the best opportunity in the world. You can have the best proposal, the best idea, the best concept, but you've irritated them. That's not how you want to start a relationship. Yeah, the money in sales is always in the follow-up. Follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. And it doesn't matter if they've been your customer one time or a thousand times. You always want to treat them the very best. So follow-up. The fortune is in the follow-up is what we say. Sales lingo. Okay, so competitors do not ever say in the global economy that we live in today that you do not have a competitor, that nobody does it like you do. It's just not true. You know, it may not be exactly like yours, but it'll work good enough. So everybody has competitors. One of the things great salespeople do, though, they don't worry about the competition. I know, it sounds ridiculous. I see it on your faces. But they don't worry about the competition. What great salespeople do, they think about being the best that they can be. Now, do they know what their competition does? 
Do they know the differentiators between them and the competition? You bet, to the best of their ability. But they don't worry about them. You know, I'm sure if any of y'all had to deal with salespeople and they come in and they go, I know, you know, so-and-so over here said they would do, don't do that. Lead with what you're powerful at. Lead with your value. What makes you great? Don't lead with what the other guy says he thinks makes him great. We don't care. You're there to sell you, your great idea, why they want to work with you, why you are the best of the best of the best. Do you need to know what your competition does? You bet. But we don't need to sell for them. You sell for yourself. And if you don't know what you're the best at, because sometimes you're too close to the forest for the trees and you don't, ask people, what do you most enjoy about working with our company? What serves you best with our product? How long have you been able to not have to do a redesign because we did this up front? If you cannot say what it is that you're great at, then tell what other people say about you. Ask other people and then say that, you know. But the thing in sales is, you know, if you can't tell what you're great at, and we're not talking about being egotistical here. We're not talking about being a peacock and, and strutting. No, we're talking about the facts. We're talking about dealing in reality. What are you great at? And say it with confidence. People get the difference between confidence and egotistical. I promise you. They know. She is serious about what she's doing. They did this. Their clients are happy with them because. So how do you differentiate yourself from the competition? What are you doing? What are they doing? And what do you do better? Tell people. Okay. So let's see. McGraw-Hill, this is not mine, but McGraw-Hill did a study years ago talking about 90% of the sales in America are done by 10% of the salespeople. And when they really delved into that, I know you want to think it's something wazoo, you know, crazy, but it's not. It's these kind of fundamental things. Having a plan, being prepared, knowing the questions you want to ask, knowing what the competition does, knowing how you do it better. You know, being able to communicate that, communicating on a regular basis, following up always, and then working your plan and having your plan work for you again and again and again. That's the only difference between the top 10% and the other 90%. So if you think about in America, if 90% of the sales are done by 10% of the salespeople, where do you fall on the spectrum? And to be in the top 10% that you just have to fine tune these things. And this is one of the things I loved about the project management group is what I think about you being brilliant at always as project management is being analytical and being process driven. So oftentimes people think sales is just blah, blah, blah. Sales is really a science. There is a process. This is how you do it. This is what you do first. This is what you do next. It's a process. When I first started consulting, I was only going to work with technology companies, startups to be specific, because that was my background was uh, technology companies. And one of the first uh, companies was uh, they, they had maybe 10 people, but they were all engineers. And, you know, they were just all over the board as it had to do with these sales. And then one day I said to me, you all are engineers. Just start for a moment and tell me, how do you, you know, you got that RFQ in, so how do you come up with the design for that? I'll just be quiet and listen. And they went, well, first we did this, and first, and next we did this, next we did this, and I went, great. This is sales. First we do that, you know, and it was just like that V8 moment. And for me too, because I'd never really thought about what a process it was. And then when we learn how to do it, we learn the questions we have, we learn who is the best prospects for us, we do our own research, we figure out who they are, and then we tell people and we engage them in our help, we shorten the cycle, and we do it again and again and again. And it's a process. It's a process. And it can work brilliantly for you. And so that's what that statistic, even though I wish I, I had done the research, I would have loved to have seen the rest of the data in that study, is the most powerful one. So um, what do you, when you think about when you have an issue or something, who do you think of collaborating with? 
Is it your team? You have a friend? 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 Because they're not involved in your business, you can tell them what the whole deal is? Well, he's, he's uh, one guy, and he's very experienced in the business. And, and he's lived elsewhere, and, and he's going to boil it down. And he's not going to get into a lot of weeds, but you know, you get the nugget from him that you need. Absolutely. It's like the objective third party. You know, I say to people oftentimes, you know, they bring me in and, and, you know, I ask very direct questions. Well, you know, I'm not anybody's boss. I don't sign their paycheck. I don't do their reviews. And so when I ask them direct questions and they tell me the direct answers, it's like, oh, well, if we do this. And then they can change and they can do that. But, you know, sometimes when you work for somebody for a long time, your boss is great, loves you, but can't be so honest with you. You know, doesn't ask the things they want to. You know, some customers, you work with them for a long time. You become friends, which is great. But then sometimes it makes it hard to ask the tough questions, you know, and do the things you need to do. So when we're thinking about collaborating and trying things or doing things or something isn't working, we really do. We need resources. We need people outside of that. And so when I think about professional organizations like this, where you come together collectively to learn, you know, various things, you know, one of the things, you know, coming here, you don't have to say who your customer is or anything like that, but, you know, just asking people while you're having pizza, whoever's sitting next to you, you know, I'm working on a project, you know, we've got this kind of thing going on. Have you ever experienced that? You know, how did that work for you? How did you get past that? You know, that kind of thing. Great salespeople collaborate with other salespeople. We don't ever think, you know, we know everything. In this community, I've, I've been in Dallas for a long time now, and I go to classes that other people conduct about how to do sales. And one time I came in a little bit late, you know, and sort of, sort of snuck in, and then when it was time for a break, somebody turned around and went, Debbie, what in the world are you doing here? And I'm just like, I'm just, you know, it's a great teacher. You know, I want to learn. It's like, well, you know everything about sales. You can never know anything, everything about sales. You just can't. You have to continue to learn. And also, in the global world that we live in today, it is no longer about just how we do business in the United States. Even though your business may be in the United States, you may only sell in the United States. My husband's in the chemical industry right now. And all of that that's happened in Japan, I cannot tell you the ways that it is impacting his clients that he sells to here in the United States. General Motors can't get the right dye for a particular color of paint for cars, so they can't get those cars out of Detroit, you know? And it's just, you know, it's crazy. So it's like, well, who else could do that particular kind of paint or that dye or whatever it is they want or what they need? Well, if you have relationships with people, you know, all over the world and you, you know, call on them, send emails. LinkedIn, is everybody on LinkedIn? Please. If not, please do it. Yes. Uh, I mean, do that. You know, I have sent out emails to people that I don't know, but they knew you and I knew you. And I said, you know, I'm Joe's friend. And they respond. You know, they're in India. My book is actually translated part of it in Polish. You know, I mean, you just can't know. So what is it you need to collaborate and don't any longer be limited just within the confines of, you know, our city, our state, our country? You know, your footprint is global, and there are tons of people that would be delighted to help you and collaborate with what you want to do. Um, you know, one of the things, too, we talk about in sales is your time. And, you know, you all know 24-7, 365, of course. But my question always to people is, what are you doing for the next 168 hours? 160 hours is seven days, 24 hours a day. And most oftentimes when I go in to talk to people about sales, they say, we don't have time for that. Really? So what are you doing with your time? You know, I did not come up with this exercise. You know, Deming did, and I did it years ago. It's brilliant. But if for the next week, I'm, you don't need a computer, an app, or anything else, a piece of paper and a pencil will do, but keep up with what you do for the next seven days, 24 hours a day. And then at the end of the week, kind of sort out your time. How much time did you spend sleeping, eating, getting dressed, exercising, doing those kind of things, your personal life, and then in your business? How much time did you spend emailing? How much time did you spend in meetings? How much time did you spend driving? 
You know, so oftentimes when we talk about having a goal, having a plan, you know, we've just been doing things the way that we've been doing it forever, and we don't even think about why we do it. To step back, don't change anything for the next 168 hours. Just do what you've done and document it. But when you look at and see where you've really spent your time, you'll be amazed at how much time you could have if you reallocated it, if you were aware of it. So when people say they don't have time to do sales, it's like, well, if we could just look at what we do for the next 168 hours, if we could only find five hours to do sales, but that we'd really have a process and plan on how we're going to do it, we can make those five hours sing for you. So what are you doing with your time? And how many of y'all, what do you think is the average uh, for how many hours a week people watch TV? Average. Say? More. 35 hours a week. It's a job. This is exactly it. And sometimes what we do, we don't have enough time tonight, but we'll, have, we'll tell people in advance, you know, we're going to speak and we'll say, we're going to do this quick exercise. Everybody bring, you know, your BlackBerry, your iPhone, your, your, roller, your, your uh, day timer, whatever it is, and we just do it quickly. Okay, so everybody start with last Monday. What would you do? You know, just kind of real quickly. Tuesday, real quickly at all. And even, you know, they think about, well, I got home at 7 that night, but I didn't go to bed till 11.30. The game was on, you know, so I watched X amount of hours that night. Now, 35 adds up pretty quick. Anybody think about, the, the one I always use is, so oftentimes people talk about a sport they want to do, like golf or something like that. So how much time does it take to take a lesson, you know, to drive to the course, you know, to, to do a few practice rounds and all? It's merely a few hours. And so how many of your 35 hours of TV are you willing to give up to go do something fun that you've been telling everybody that you really wanted to do? Well, in sales, it's the same thing. You say you want to do this. But how much time are you really allocating to sales? And especially when you're starting a business and you wear many hats. My business, I'm a one-person company. So, you know, I can be the janitor, the secretary, the president, the salesman, you know, and everything. I can't be doing sales all day, every day. You know, so if it is that it's that important to you, none of you would have any business if somebody didn't sell something, then shouldn't you figure out how to be the best you can be at it and how you can make it happen the most quickly? and the most effectively and the most profitably that can continue on and on until either you decide to sell it or close it. I am delighted to be here with you tonight, and I leave you with uh, my, my favorite quote is, you don't have to be great to get started, but you do have to get started to be great. If you are doing sales, you're creating, you're trying to get other people to buy into your ideas, and you feel like you're not very good at it, it's okay. Today is the beginning of a new day for you. My husband always tells the children when things don't go right, you know, as far as I know, the sun's coming up tomorrow. You don't have to be great to get started, but you do have to get started to be great. I hope tonight there was an idea, an inkling of something that happened for you that can help you create more business and happiness in your business and your life tomorrow. I thank you. I would love to take uh, questions. Anybody have questions? Yes? Yes? Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask all of you to complete the survey. That would help us tremendously. Yes. Yes. And we need your feedback. And Debbie, thank you so very much. Oh, I am really, really delighted. It. This is great. Great group. I have read your book. It is a great read. And there's a surprise inside the book. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm spoiling it. <laughs> That's that okay. We love it. We love it. <laughs> Questions? Anybody? Please. Yeah, as a project manager, you know, I'm selling concepts and ideas and trying to get resources to focus on my work effort. Um, you know, so I'm thinking about how do I say, what, what's, what's my difference from the competition? You know, so maybe my competition is the next project manager who also needs to get things. Absolutely. You know, we're both working for the same company, we both have overall the same goals. So you know, in that scenario, what, what would I try to present or, or differentiate myself with? Maybe get them work on my project. Well, you need to convey, you know, because it's a business. It's not your business. You're working for someone, yeah. right? Okay. So what's most important to them? Bottom line. Sure. So it just is. You know, this is the deal. I didn't say it earlier, but salespeople who don't want to talk about money, just shoot them. You know, 
we don't do this for free. You know, everybody has to sell something. So what you want to convey is how this will, what, what your project is, will most benefit the bottom line. Okay. okay. Mine doesn't most benefit the bottom line, but I still need to get it done. Well, then, but then how does it affect the bottom line? Yeah. Indirectly. Right. Exactly. So it has to be that. So are you excited about your project? Do you believe? But see, but this is, this is, these are the little things. You know, are you excited? Are you talking about it? Or are you only talk about it when you come to the meeting? Or, you know, you run into somebody at lunch and said, hey, did you hear? You know, I'm working on this. I'm, I'm really excited. You know, we're going to be going for the budget review, you know, next week. You know, we'd really love any input you have, anything we should include that maybe we haven't thought about already. Engage, you know, when we're talking about collaborating, engage other people in your success. Reach out. Maybe somebody that's not even on your direct team but that's in the company that will be impacted by what your project does. Pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Call them walk over to their office and say, hey, listen, we're going to be presenting this next week, and this is going to go for budget review. You know, what do you think? Any ideas? Anything maybe we haven't considered? We'd love your input. If you're genuine, you know, people get that, and they want to help you. And then they help you this time, and then next time when you need something, they help you, you know, again and again. But you have to really care about it, you know. So does that help? Yeah. Good, good. What else? Yes, please. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Great question. Yes, yes. And I was just going to say, even if it doesn't affect the bottom line, it's always good to understand the business levers. So a lot of times IT might have an idea, but they haven't connected it to how it affects organizational strategy. So keeping in mind this is going to affect this indirectly, which might have a bottom line effect, means that you've taken a step back away from your small project and put it in the grand scheme of how it affects the business, right? So a lot of times that means even more than the immediate, you know, two to three percent process improvement. Yeah. It might have some other implication in the long run. And that's a great point about thinking about the big picture. Not everything is about today. You know, don't you want to be one of those companies that's here, you know, 20 years from now? Whoever thought Apple would be a long-term buy? What else? Please. Your comments on uh, work, family, balance. Oh my gosh. I'm flying out in the morning. My daughter is graduating from Cal State at 3 o'clock on Friday after eight years. Yes, yes. Imagine me standing on the castle at Disneyland cheering on Friday night. Um, it's tough. It's really tough. I have always, you know, worked, my husband works, you know, I own a business now, he owns a business, you know, two great children, and it's kind of like, you know, when I was talking about the 168 hours, you know, looking at really what we're doing with our time, really what we're doing with our time, because isn't what we all say that is important to us is our family, you know, our friends, you know, those kind of things, and yet when we really look at our time, what did we spend the least amount of time with? You know, and so I think the balance is just being aware, you know, of what you're doing with your time and what is it, you know, if you're clear, you know how when we go to fly on the airplane, they always say, you know, to put the oxygen mask over you before the baby, you know, take care of you so you can take care of them. And so to really look at ourselves and are we taking care of ourselves? Do we have the job that we want to have? Are we doing the kind of work that we want to do? You know, are we happy in that where we are spending all this time? Or do we need to change? You know, Zig Ziglar talks about we're really just one person, yet people talk about, well, when I'm at work, you know, I do this, but when I'm at home, I do this. You're one person. So how do you incorporate all of that into one life and, and uh, find that balance? And, and the thing is, what I've learned about balance is it's never, you know, it's kind of like in a marriage, you know, it's never 50-50. You know, sometimes it's 80-20, you know, sometimes it's 40-60. Um, the same is true with your whole family. You know, just be times that you're really busy and engaged and, you know, you can't, you know, you can't be there. But then when you have the times when you're there to really be there. So be present, you know, wherever you at. But it, it's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing struggle. Like nobody wants to follow me home tonight while I watch this Mavs game and see all I have to do before I get on that flight in the morning. But I will be there with bells on. And, of course, she'll think we just whisk in and are ready to go. It, it's, it's ongoing forever. Um, I was just going to ask you, what do you, I mean, particularly in sales, what do you ever do 
because sometimes it's like you have to always be on. <laughs> What do you do to just kind of rejuvenate yourself? I sit on the back porch with my beagles and drink margaritas. <laughs> no. Well, kind of like what I was saying to you, it's the balance in knowing that I really have to step away, you know, at all, because I really do get wound up in it sometimes, you know, and all. And so to plan, you know, like when you look at your calendar, how many of you do this? You know, you look at your calendar or, you know, if you got it on your iPhone or whatever for the whole year. You know, I'm plugging in first, you know, what's your vacation for this year? You know, what's your time? I really try to be intentional about, you know, taking, you know, it may just be three or four days, but, you know, some chunks of time. I go to Rio every summer, you know, kind of thing for seven days, you know, and to fill that in and then kind of think about, you know, okay, maybe I need an extra day here, an extra day there. And then when I look at my calendar and look at a whole month has gone by and, you know, I haven't seen, you know, my friends or been to dinner. Years ago, I started doing a deal. I actually sent it in my Christmas card. This has been seven or eight years ago. I had somebody that was a friend, that was a colleague, but we'd gone all year and we never had lunch. We didn't have dinner. We didn't have, you know, we chatted quick on the phone. And so on my Christmas card, I said, I propose that once a month, you know, the third Wednesday at Me Casino at Coit and Campbell, we have lunch. And we've been doing it for eight years. We don't make it all 12 months a year, but we make it eight out of 12, you know. And so it's just like, you know, it's like taking care of you first, you know. And then sometimes, you know, when it just gets, it's just busy. Like last year, excuse me, not last year, but the year before, my husband and I took no vacation. You know, both of our businesses were struggling. You know, we didn't know what the economy, you know, was going to do. And so in all our glorious wisdom, we canceled our vacations and we didn't go anywhere. And I tell you, by December, when Christmas rolled around, we were both like dead. You know, like mentally, you know, I mean, it was just, it was terrible. And it was like, what were we thinking? It wasn't about money. You know, we could have taken some, but we just didn't. It's like, we're going to work harder. We're, we know better, but we were just in it. And so really taking a look, you know, for yourself without anybody else's input and your calendar and just say, you know, I, you know, I need a day for me, you know, every third weekend, or, you know, I need a vacation once a quarter of a couple of days, you know, those kind of things, but take care of you first. Take care of you first. You'll be able to take care of all of them. And sometimes easier said than done. It, it goes on. Who else? Please. Talk some compensation for salespeople. Compensation for salespeople. Pay them well. <laughs> How much do you think they're worth? You know, unfortunately, what I see a lot of people do is, you know, they want to get them cheap. They don't want to pay them, you know, much commission, and then they wonder why they leave. You know, they've invested in their training and education, those kind of things and all. What I say, if you're hiring salespeople, you know, like a salary plus commission, you know, pay them a salary that will cover their mortgage, their groceries, you know, the essential things. You know, generally in this day and time, depending young or older, you know, three to $5,000. You know, so that they're not getting up every day going, oh, my God, how am I going to pay my mortgage? You know, how am I going to, you know, have food on the table for my family tonight? So that they're, you know, they're with you during the day. But then when you compensate them, you know, one of the things in business, you know, it's like generally people want to compensate them less the more they do. You know, I say compensate them for all that they do, but the more they do, compensate them more. You know, what is it that you really want them to do? Do you really only want them to do a million a year? Or do you want them to do 10 million a year? Compensate them for what you want. Do you want them to be with you long term? Or do you want to just hire the, you know, great kid that came out of college and, you know, have them for a year, you want to be that training ground and then, you know, move them along? Or do you really want to develop a team that will be with you? But, you know, I always tie it to profitability. I think those are the best compensation plans. And those companies that think, you know, they don't want to tell their employees how profitable they are or not is just, I think it's silly. You know, and all. everybody needs to know. It's been one of the unfortunate parts of the last 10 years when people become unemployed. They don't understand what they cost a company. They don't understand why the company let that many people go and they said it saved them this much money. 
They don't understand the company's taxes they have to pay on them and, you know, what benefits really cost and all those kind of things and all. So I think, you know, when you share with your team, you know, establish what, and I also don't think it's the same for everybody. You know, each person you hire, you know, whatever their base is, you need to negotiate that individually with them. But from a profitability standpoint, you know, it's like if it's this profitable, we pay this. If it's this profitable, we pay this. And, and the truth is about always being generous, generous. You know, and if your salesperson can bring you something over and above, you know, like as far as profitability, I was a manufacturer's rep for years, and one of the things we had in our contract, you know, we may have had a contract that said we got paid 8% on the deal, but if we could bring in a deal that the profit was more than 27%, we split 50-50, whatever the additional profit was. Do you know how incentivized I was to sell that way? And we sold $100 million a year. You know, so you always want to be generous. And, and for heaven's sakes, always write everything down. It just is. It's one of the worst things with sales. Salespeople are nice and they're great. We're going to pay you this and we're going to do that. And then the first month comes along that isn't so great. And it's like, but I thought I was going to get. Write it down. Write it down. And if you have the kind of business where you just want to pay a salary, because let me assure you, there are salespeople out there that would love to work for just a salary so they know exactly how much they're going to make every month. They don't like a commission structure. There are plenty of those people out there, too. Then decide what that salary is. For yourself, that would be difficult because you haven't, you know, you don't have a, a track record, you know, history and all. But for companies that have been in business for a long time, Look at, you know, your history. You know, what was the profitability and all? Come up with a number for them. And then pay them a bonus, you know, over and above, you know, if they do more. Others? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll be here. If anybody's got an individual question, maybe they weren't comfortable asking in front of the group, I'd be delighted to take that. Everybody has my contact information. I would welcome your email or a phone call if you have another question, except I won't be back in the office until next Tuesday. So I wish you all well. Have a great evening. Thank you.